Oh, now I'm in trouble. Okay. Those are nice, aren't they? Yeah, they sure yes. are. Today is Thursday the 19th. Yep. Thank you. Yep. There's a great deal of fascination and really emphasis that you see in the NAR on signs and wonders. It, it draws you to see what the scripture has said about those very same things. A group of people came to Jesus saying, will you show us a sign? And Jesus has a correction for them. We read in Matthew chapter 16, verse 1 tells us, the Pharisees and the Sadducees came testing him and asking if he would show them a sign from heaven. And Jesus answered and said to them, When it is evening, you will say, It will be fair weather, for the sky is red. In the morning, it will be foul weather today, for the sky is red and threatening. And then he calls them hypocrites. And he says, You know how to discern the face of the sky, but you cannot discern the signs of the times. And then he says, A wicked and an adulterous generation seeks after a sign. Now, he not only chastises them for wanting to see parlor tricks or some kind of a show, something sensory, but he also tells them, I will give you a sign, just not like what you're expecting. Now, you can recognize how the weather is going to be tomorrow, but you can't even recognize that the physical representation of God in the flesh stands right in front of you. You're oblivious to who I am and what I represent. So the one sign that I will give for you is the sign of the prophet Jonah. He was as good as dead, three days gone, and came back to life. The message of repentance is what the people in Nineveh heeded for a hundred years. There was that removal of that judgment because they did repent. Jesus' message to them would be just like Jonah's. You will see me put to death as well as dead for three days. I will return. The message is one of repentance, not of signs and wonders. In being involved in this for 20 years, I, uh, I was addicted. I've, I've always had an addiction issue, and I traded them one addiction to the other, and this new high was, I thought, God's answer to, to my addiction, <laughs> because I became addicted to it. Though when I read the Bible, I read about testing the spirits, but it never occurred to me to do that, because I was so caught up in the power and the sensations that were happening that it changed your reality. It really did with each encounter that you had with that, your reality began to change and your thought process was changing and evolving into um, this new belief system. But in it, I lost the real love and the real sweetness and goodness of God and I took the artificial sweetener that causes cancer, that kills. Jesus came to give us life and to give us love to care for humanity. Though this looks like and they say that it's they care, it's a very self-centered belief system that is, operates on lust, the lust of the flesh. that would appear in the conferences. Um, gold dust would appear on people's faces. What I, the gold dust that I experienced, I would just see specks of gold on their face as like glitter. It would look like glitter on their faces. And they were saying that gold teeth were appearing. I never saw the gold teeth. I saw feathers falling from the sky. And I saw oil um, coming out of uh, a person's hand oil just coming out of their hands. And there were also he, these incredible healings that we were hearing about. People were being healed of cancer and, and um, legs were growing out and all these things. I never personally, though I had been around this for 20 years, saw anyone healed ever. I've seen a lot, I saw a lot of people go up for the healings. I saw a lot of manifestations of the spirits on their body just as I had experienced it when I went up for healing, but was never personally healed. 
comfortable with Todd Bentley because there were just certain people in that circuit that reminded me of the devil worshippers that I saw in, up in Oregon and they just had that presence about him so I was never real comfortable with him. Todd Bentley boasts that he can lay hands on the sick and that he's raised people from the dead and uh, you know the power that he has you know, there's nothing he can't do with this power that he has. And he displays the power. I mean, the power hits you, the uh, knocks you down, makes you drunk, the laughter, all these typical signs that you see in the Bethel Church. Um, all these physical manifestations happen in his services. Aren't you drunk in the Holy Ghost? Drunk in the Holy Ghost? Fire! When I was going through to the Bethel things, and we would testify that yes, indeed, we had uh, been touched by God, and we thought we were healed because we had these physical manifestations, and we felt the power hit us, which we believed was God. When we would get home, we would realize that we were healed, and they would teach, like even with Benny Hinn, was that you know maybe you didn't feel like you were healed at the time but that your healing would come. Sometimes your healing was a process, but you totally believed that you were healed, so you would get up and you they would make you come up and give these testimonies that you were healed. And you believed you were healed because you had a physical force of power go through your body. I have visited many guru ashrams, that means Hindu retreat centers in India, and probably one of the most impressive compounds was Satya Sai Baba's main ashram in Andhra Pradesh, India. He's the guru, by the way, who said, I am God and you two are God. The only difference between you and me is that while I am aware of it, you are completely unaware. He is famous for signs and wonders around the materialization of the booty holy ash, said to endow prosperity and burn away all sins. The Bhuti Holy Ash is considered the most precious object in a spiritual sense. Materializing objects is performed by NAR prophets who display gold dust, feathers, and oil to millions of Christians claiming they bring posterity, healing, and wealth. Many disappointed NAR followers' warnings and their disenchantments can be read on the internet. In India, one only has to see the poverty and ill health among Hindu followers of gurus to realize signs and wonders, both East and West, delude the followers who rationalize their addiction and overlook the fakery of religious pretenders. The Bible warns, woe to those who call evil good and good evil, who put darkness for light and light for darkness who put bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. It never made me question that it was fake because I felt the sensations, I felt the power in the room. And I believe, I believe that power could make anything happen. So I never questioned it. I read about testing the spirits, but I never, that never, never occurred to me. It never occurred to me to do that because I was so caught up in the the power and the sensations that were happening that it changed your reality. It really did. With each encounter that you had with that, your reality began to change and your thought process was changing and evolving into um, this new belief system. And something that I would always experience, and that was in our church, would be entities there. And we were told they were angels. I would feel them when you would touch them. They were, po they were standing around in the services, and I could literally sense them, I could feel them, and when I would touch them, sensations would go through my body. When the topic of angels comes up, we know that there are innumerable numbers of, of angels, but we don't know very many of them by name, actually only a few. Gabriel is one that is mentioned, Michael is one that is mentioned. Those would be seen as, as godly angels, ones who have kept fidelity to Jehovah God. But then there is Lucifer. We now call him Satan. Uh, we know that a third of the angels fell with him in his rebellion. 
So the idea that there are angels that are, uh, if you will, sympathetic towards Satan, and then there are also those who serve God who never rebelled. Angels are coming. Not holy angels. Not my God. Satan transforming himself into an angel of light, and he's whispering into people's ears, and because they're open to those things, because they haven't studied to show themselves approved workmen who need not to be ashamed, because they don't have the real Holy Spirit in them, because they are power hungry. They're allowing these things to influence them. I believe these are sincere men, but they are sincerely wrong. John Crowder is um, also another prophet operating in with the prophets that are out of Bethel. Crowder had come to our church several times and he's probably best known for Token the Ghost where he puts his hands together and like he's gonna smoke a joint and he's inhaling this spirit which he equates to just smoking marijuana and uh, getting stoned. So at, with each time that he sucks the air in, he becomes more and more intoxicated. And there's a lot of manifestations around him because he, uh, he encourages you to, to really get hammered. He calls it getting hammered. What we call getting drunk in the spirit, he calls getting hammered. And with each breath that he took in, pretending that he was smoking a joint, would be equivalent to each person imparting that power to you. So with each toke, the more hammered he would get, we would say we were getting drunk. But when he came to our church, the thing that I noticed was it was all about glorifying getting hammered or token the ghost or getting high on God. And it was like he was going to win these followers that were doing drugs by giving him this drug that was way better than the drug that they were using, which troubled me because it was, to me, he was glorifying being on drugs. So he, he would come and then he would encourage us all after the service, after we all got hammered, drunk, whatever we called it, and uh, crawl around on the floor and laughter and all these signs. and We called them signs and wonders when we would get in that intoxicated state. He would encourage us all to go out to witness on the streets. So I thought, well, this will be interesting. I just want to see what goes on. How does he win these kids? Because he's always boasting how he's bringing all these kids in. This is his ministry. So we go out to the coffee shop, and I'm sitting there, and I'm watching them. And, um, and I was amazed at what I was hearing him say because he never said anything other than, this is better than drugs. This is, you can get high on this. And he kept just saying, you can get high on this. And I thought, this is really perverted to me. I didn't see, what was he lifting up? He was lifting up getting high. The uh, NAR is very much youth-oriented. We see it especially with uh, Mike Bickle and the IHOP movement. Very much at the heart of the NAR is an appeal and an outreach to the youth who genuinely, if you were to ask them, love the Lord, but they're given counterfeit. They are given experience. They are given those, what they would see as tangible things, that are not biblical. They're not being pointed by these churches to read the Word of God, to find out whether or not the experience is valid or reasonable. They don't point them to the Scripture in any way at all. They point to the signs and the wonders as its own self-evidence. They don't have the, the scripture as their guide. From there, once they have them believing that they are part of this kingdom work that is going on, they see themselves as being able to usher in that kingdom, which is contrary to Jesus' own teaching. In Bible-believing churches, we understand that the Holy Spirit's at work. He's drawing men to Christ. He indwells us. At salvation, He comes upon us to give us those giftings and that power to, to do the things that Christ has asked us to do. But we don't make the emphasis on the Holy Spirit. Jesus said when the Holy Spirit comes, He won't speak of Himself. He's going to glorify Christ. He's going to give us a greater understanding of Christ. He's the Spirit of truth. He's going to guide us and lead us into all truth. And the greatest work of the Holy Spirit is when you open your Bible and you're reading, that Spirit of truth is working in your mind and in your heart to make sure that we understand and rightly divide the Word of God. The promise to them is that this new generation of youth, as they gather them in these conferences, they talk to them about being unique. There's never been a generation like you. You're that end-time apostle, and you're that end-time move of the Holy Spirit. And 
you're unique. There's never been anyone quite like your generation. Now, you say that enough times to that group of people, then they start to believe that there's something is unique about them, that they are somehow different, and there's never been anybody quite like them. Now you tell them that they will also be empowered with giftings and signs and wonders superior to anything that had been seen before. It's intoxicating. It's something that will get quite a, uh, quite a, in their words, a revival going. People excited about them being part of something that is unique and never, never been seen before. My husband and I were originally part of the vineyard movement when it first started, until we realized how apostate and how far from biblical understanding this organization was. John Wimber, head of the vineyard churches, said himself to me when I brought to his attention the demonic manifestations and encounters and the people he was recommending who were hardcore, well-known, channelers and occultists, he said to me, there, there, dear, our God is bigger than your big, bad, old devil. The Holy Spirit will straighten it out. We don't want to quench the new young prophets by asking them to test it. Yet if you don't test it, how do you know that the voice in your head is really God? How do you know the message you sincerely claim and believe to be from Jesus is from Jesus? Jesus calling first published in 2004 is a daily devotional inspirational reading authored by Sarah Young who earned her master's degree in counseling and biblical studies at Covenant Theological Seminary and has introduced millions upon millions of Christians into many occult and new age practices as though they were biblically approved. Unless you have a solid source of absolute truth, truth that is true regardless of what you may think about it. The truth from God against which to test your experiences, there is no way of testing it. The occultist means of testing is very empirical, very pragmatic. If the information you are receiving is good, it's from God. If the feelings and the experiences you have seem uplifting and encouraging, it's from God. Bringing the concept of testing the spirits to the Christian church today, the apostate Christian church, the new apostolic reformation, and the, all the new apostles and prophets, they will tell you, as did John Arnott, head of the Toronto Blessing Church, don't even consider the possibility you might be deceived. As long as you're sincere, you can't be. NAR theology says God is being restricted by fundamentalist Christianity that places too much emphasis on the authority of God's word as being more important than spiritual experiences, which they claim can be accessed by any who wish to bypass biblical thinking and cognitive intellect and tap into spirit power, also known as quantum mysticism, that they mistake as Holy Spirit power. In a book called The Physics of Heaven, NAR proponents say many in the church have tended to write off all dabblings into quantum mysticism as blasphemous and demonically inspired. However, there are a few courageous Christians, they say, who are beginning to speak up and say, wait a minute, there may be some God truth there that really belongs to us and that we should know about. Despite what Christians in the NAR movement say, they are not being courageous by dabbling into New Ageism, but are indeed involved in rebellion and are turning millions to what Hinduism, Eastern mysticism and Gnosticism have always taught that spirit experiences from the spirit world that bring power is good. But Proverbs defines the rebellion as there is a way that seems right to a man, but its end is the way of death. Eastern mysticism teaches experiences rooted in the five traditional senses of hearing, seeing, smelling, touching, and tasting belong to the gross world or the material realm which is not identified as reality. Rather, 
is understood to be the unreal dimension or Maya. Mysticism informs the subtle world is beyond the five senses and is a sixth sense perceived to be reality. When developed through yoga discipline or activated through any mental stimulation resulting in altered states, the so-called subtle dimension brings spiritual experiences. Hindu teachings say humankind is in spiritual ignorance and darkness unless it's dispelled by radiance, light, spiritual knowledge, etc. through involvement in spiritual practices or insights given by spiritual masters. One guru from Mumbai, India, Dr. Jayant Balaji Athavele, by profession a consultant clinical hypnotherapist, was once an atheist. He converted to Hinduism after discovering that many of his sick patients who had little chance of recovery successfully regained good health after performing certain Hindu rituals under the guidance of spiritually evolved persons he called saints. But in actuality, they're gurus who imparted various parts of Eastern mysticism. Soon, what Dr. Athavale realized was that the science of spirituality was far superior to physical and psychological science which leaves out the entire spiritual dimension. Through the guidance of his guru, Bhaktaraj Maharaj, the doctor became involved in Eastern philosophy and contacted the spirit world through Hindu disciplines such as mental contemplation, holy breathing, visualization, etc. These awakened him to supposedly divine consciousness and higher levels of knowledge. These experiences he spreads today by giving lectures on them as what he calls the science of spirituality. What's happening is that mystics credit benefits associated with spirit world contact as being scientific, attempting to credit supernatural powers as being worthy because they work. In actuality, we know demons have power to perform, but involvement in their powers is prohibited by the biblical God who knows of the resulting dangers that not only have consequences in our physical life, but for all eternity. The supernatural world can't be measured through orthodox scientific methods because science measures the natural world with observable physical evidence through observation or experimentation under controlled conditions. Demonic works are based on their characteristics. They're liars, divisive, destroyers, seducers, etc. They are not controllable or observable. Therefore, mystics' classifications come under the heading of pseudoscience. Only God, who is spirit and truth, can truthfully explain the spirit realm. Truth is a person. Jesus says he was truth and said his spirit was truth. He also said the Father and he were one. The existence of a triune God, three persons in one, is explained in the Bible. However, there are also spirit entities called angels who were created by God. And because God is perfect, at one time all creation was perfect too. Some angels remain obedient to God and worship him and do his bidding and are his ministering angels. But the Bible explains that a third of the angels rebelled against God when they followed Lucifer, described as an angel of light. These are today fallen angels who are anti-God, anti his word of authority, filled with confusion, lies, division, mayhem, and so on. Mystics who follow these spirits are doomed to delusion, seduction, bondage, and ultimate destruction. Many within Christianity misinterpret the biblical explanation of the devil or his rebels and fall prey to their lies, getting hooked into harnessing demonic powers for their own gain. In the Physics of Heaven book, about nine NAR leaders, described as a Holy Spirit think tank, gave their opinions to authors 
Judy Franklin and Ellen Davis, who assembled this so-called team of seers to reveal mysteries based on their spirit experiences to equip NAR followers into what they term as the fullness of Pentecost. These NAR prophets give their insights of a so-called God hidden in sound, light, vibrations, frequencies, energy, and quantum physics. Sadly, their search for the personal God of the Bible cannot be found in the impersonal forces of sound, light, vibrations, energy, and quantum physics. They are leading millions to the impersonal energy found within Hinduism and New Age One Worldism. The Biblical Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are completely sufficient in the purity and holiness of their relationship with each other. God says He is love and is able to identify Himself as such because the triune God is involved in a triune relationship. The impersonal consciousness of Hinduism that attempts to explain itself as love and truth cannot be such because those emotions must be based on relationship or couldn't exist. NAR theology is captivating millions into its mystical New Ageism for the furtherance of an end time agenda for NAR dominionism. In the foreword of the Physics of Heaven, NAR prophet Chris Vallotton, senior associate pastor of Bethel Church in Redding, California, an overseer at Bethel School of Supernatural Ministry, expounds on the NAR message of his fellow false teachers, saying, Through their collective intelligence, these seers have emerged with new perspectives never before pondered. Actually, these so-called new perspectives have been furthered for thousands of years by seers usually associated with the dark powers of sorcery and divination. Chris and his wife Kathy believe, as do thousands in the NAR movement, that they are fulfilling God's mandate to train, equip, and raise up the coming Elijah generation, a company of bride warriors for the end time harvest that will hasten the return of Jesus Christ. In reality, these aspirations are achieved by attaching to and working with spirit powers of dominion. The book's premise suggests there is a good side of the New Age and that Christians must redeem back the sea of quantum light that undergirds everything and more importantly, we need to know how to access it. Interestingly, similar to NAR theology, the divinity of Hindu mysticism sees everything as one and as a consciousness able to be accessed. New Age spirituality also abounds with books about pursuing the God-like energies for mystical encounters, healing powers, and oneness with the divine. Further similarities existing between New Ageism and NAR theology gets even more confusing as the physics of heaven explains for every counterfeit, there has to be a real version. Whenever you see a counterfeit, it says, it means a real exists, and that a lie just proves the existence of a truth. Therefore, the book argues, the New Age has counterfeited Bible teachings, which courageous Christians today are attempting to recapture. Author Ellen Davis says she decided to investigate and bring my scientific background and my faith in Jesus Christ into the mix of my search for truth. I decided to examine New Age thought and practice for anything precious that might be extracted from the worthless. Now we are hearing more Christians taking back truths. Herein lies the danger. Davis searching for truth outside the Bible, yet purporting to have faith in Jesus Christ, uses her scientific background to formulate a Christianized spiritual science similar to Dr. Athabali. And because she doesn't have a high regard of the Bible as the inerrant word of God, 
gets compromised by rebellious spirits and their lying doctrines. Holy Scripture commands, come out from among them and be separate, says the Lord. Do not touch what is unclean and I will receive you. Another NAR prophet in contributing seer to Davis's book, Jonathan Welton, 